everybody, welcome back to Chasing Fret. My name is Jason Shadrick with Premier Guitar, and this week I am joined with the illustrious Andy Ellis. Hello, everyone. And uh, <laughs> and we have a real treat for you this week. Uh, we have Neely Brosh on the show this week, and I first became aware of Neely uh, through, I think somebody had sent me a video of this young woman, looks like in her dorm room, and she's playing a Jimmy Herring tune. Mm. Um, what was it called? Uh, it was the diminished blues tune. Scapegoat blues is what it was. And she was nailing it. The video was still up online. I encourage you to check it out, but she was nailing it. And I always kind of had a distance, kept an eye on, on what she was doing. And then a number of years ago, uh, I was looking for new lesson writers and I was like, you know what? I think Neely would be, would be perfect. So I went out and hired her to write some lessons for us at Premier Guitar, and she did an excellent job with that. And the next thing you know, she's playing in Cirque Soleil and playing with Tony McAlpine and and just kind of really, really taking over. So uh, so this uh, episode we're going to talk about something that you and I talked about before and even we were planning this, is about auditioning. Yeah. And uh, Neely has a lot of wisdom to share with all of us, regardless of how long we've been playing or what size – and type of gig that we're heading toward. Yeah, and and the story about the the multiple auditions she did for the Cirque du Soleil thing, um, and how they each took different forms. That was that was really interesting to me. And and as you'll hear in the episode, it's really you know just as much of a mental side uh, of preparation as it is learning the tunes and putting the work in, and you know making sure your tones right, making sure your sounds right. Making sure your whole vibe is uh, is what you know whoever's going to be hiring you is, is looking for. So, uh, so enjoy this episode with Neely. Um, uh, feel free to rate and review uh, the podcast wherever you get your podcast. And if you want to reach out to us, hit us up at chasingfrets at premierguitar dot com. So uh, for the first episode this week, we'll jump right into it. And here's our conversation with Neely Brush. All right, here we are with Neely Brosh. How are you doing, Neely? I'm great, Jason. It's so good to see you, and you, Andy, as well. Oh, thank you, Neely. <laughs> or is that a surprise? Oh, look, there's Andy! <laughs> 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 so, Neely's going to be our guest this week. We're so excited to have her. I knew as, as soon as the idea for this podcast came up, uh, you were definitely on the short list of people. Um, at, at the very least, an excuse to like hang out and talk about guitar for an hour, because usually... <laughs> We just pass guitar jokes and whatever via text and email occasionally. But Pretty it's much. great to just kind of sit down and dive deep into something for a little while. Yeah, it's been it's been a while. You you guys at Premiere like always take such good care of me. I always love doing like mm. anything with you guys. So it's like a special treat to to talk to you anytime, Jason. Oh, well thank nice. you. And yeah. and uh Neely's also a columnist. Uh she has a handful of columns you can check out at premiereguitar.com. Um, so yeah, we, uh, we appreciate you working with us over all these years as well. So today's topic is going to be auditioning and kind of, I know you've had several gigs over the years that you've had to audition for some, you haven't necessarily. Um, but it's always interesting to me to hear about people's, uh, way they prepare for an audition, their experience with that on a variety of different levels, whether it's a huge act or whether it's even, uh, and not so huge act, you know, there's still kind of a certain level of, of per, uh, preparedness you need to do when you want to get the gig. So can you tell me a little about probably your most famous maybe audition is, is what you did for Cirque Soleil. So for those not familiar, can you tell us a little about what you did in that? And then we'll kind of back up and talk about how you got it. Sure. So um, for about two years, I was the guitarist slash uh, what's called the muse character at a Cirque du Soleil show called Michael Jackson One, which is obviously their Michael Jackson show. Um, and it was kind of an interesting role because, you know, aside from playing all the iconic solos and, and parts and everything, um, it was very showy and it was like a featured character and I had a ridiculous like costume and fire shooting guitar and everything. Um, so for me, like, you know, 
just from a personal level, my philosophy has always been like just kind of over prepare for stuff anyway, just because of my own insecurity of like, oh, what if I have to do this on the spot or that on the spot, you know? So for me to to feel more confident, I always kind of just over prepare for my own peace of mind. But in that particular situation, it was, you know, a very like foreign thing to me because part of the whole thing is like, walking around in heels, you know, while you're playing the beat it solo and backwards, actually, if if you can. And, uh, you know, I never walked in heels before. I didn't own heels. I had to, like, literally wait, wait, wait. go did to the you, store and, and... Did you have to play that? the... Did you have to play the beat it solo backwards? No, no. no. Oh. I'm saying walk backwards in oh, the heels. Gotcha. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Man, that would have been a whole other thing. No. <laughs> No, I mean, you know, it's like for me, walking in heels to begin with was just like so foreign that then like walking backwards while you're playing, you know, a challenging solo, it's just kind of like, um, but yeah, so I just kind of practice those things as much as I usually prepare the the playing side. And, you know, it, it was a learning curve and it was a different experience, but, uh, you know, it was the same kind of philosophy for me. Was there a cattle call? Was it... Uh did you did you have to go up against several other guitarists and and kind of compete? Yeah, so you know it's it's actually I guess a more uh, detailed story than than seems upfront. But I actually had three different auditions over the years to to get that role because mm. the show was created in 2012 or 13, and they basically like had put out this open casting call across the internet, like looking for a female guitar player, you know, and it was like insert picture of Jennifer Batten there, you know, or something like that. And like, it's all like decked out and you're like, oh, okay, I, I, I get it, you know. But, um, but it was an open casting call. And I think they knew that looking for a female guitar player is, is a little bit trickier. So it was like just plastered all over the internet. And I think everybody and their mother like sent me that flyer, you know. So I'd become a finalist that time, and I, and I didn't get it. It was when Gina Gleason uh, came in the picture from Baroness, who's such a great player, and she was the original muse. And she had, she had done, like, like over a 1,000 shows, which is ridiculous. Um, yeah, she was there for, like, four years, you know. So, um, so in the beginning, it was a video audition. It was, like, at first, I think it was, like, send us this thing about why you want to be a part of Cirque du Soleil and what you bring to the table and that kind of thing. And then like the next piece was play the, you know, these excerpts of four Michael Jackson song with the beaded solo being one of them. And they're like, you know, the, the focus on this is the showmanship. So like show us you can move and like all these different things, you know, so I really try to play it up. And then the second time I auditioned was to be uh, Gina's backup. It was like a few years later and it was the same kind of process. And only the third time, which was the time that I, uh, Gina had left and they were looking for somebody else, was the time when they were like, okay, we're going to actually bring you to Vegas and have a real audition with you in person. And at that point, there was another person there. And I actually was a friend of mine who I knew well. So like for us, it was, it was fine. It was like kind of funny. But even in that situation, you know, it's like we literally had to audition in front of each other. Like they had our audition on the stage. And so it was wow. like... Kind of awkward, you know, and, and, and you can see that, like, the, the team that was directing the whole thing, like, the artistic director and everything, like, we had, like, the audio team helping out and everything, but it was not the kind of situation where you get a, a rig that you're used to and everything. It was like, okay, plug her into, like, the axe effects that's, you know, three stories up, and then once you're in there, you're just, like, here's this, like, just direct, clean ass tone, and now they're like, okay, let's do beat it. <laughs> <laughs> and you're like, uh. <laughs> so, you know, it was one of those things where it, it took some time until we, we got it all worked out. And it was it was like not a guitar player type of situation. And, and neither was the gig. I mean, because, again, it really wasn't about that. And we didn't have a, a band, you know, it was like two feature musicians and, that, and that's it. So it was definitely like learning how to work with people who don't understand your art form and, and and how that works and everything and just kind of like figuring out how to work together to get to where it's supposed to go. So through that whole extended process, what were some of the things you kind of, were there certain points in that process where you made mental notes like, Neely, remember this about auditioning for the next thing that comes down the line? Yeah, actually, and it was during that same audition. Uh, the third one? Yes, yes, like when when I was, you know, 
I, I didn't realize that I was going to get the gig that time and everything, but I, I did feel like something was different about my, my mental approach because up until that point, I always kind of felt like, you know, I'm, I'm lucky to have any gig, you know what I mean? Like being paid to be a musician and do what I do, like it's always something that I've taken seriously. So to me, every audition is like the same level of like, okay, I really want to, you know, show that I can do this or whatever it is. But, um, but you know, in that, in that case, I just kind of felt, it was the first time that I felt like I don't have to prove anything, so to speak. You know, I just, in, in the past, it's always like, oh my God, I need this job, I need this job. And finally, it was that time where I was like, you know what, even if this doesn't work out, like some something else will. You know, I happened to have like another big audition that same week somehow, you know, and just like, just this kind of like more confidence in like things will work out because they have in the past and, you know, they keep moving forward and just that little bit more of like a relaxed attitude about it to me, I think is, is what made the difference that time. I, I think it channeled out, you know, in the times before where it was just like, I really like, I'm really desperate here. You know what I mean? So I think there is a difference. So then you left that gig. Uh, and another gig that you got that I would love to hear, uh, which I, which, from what you've told me before, it was quite a different process, is the Death Clock gig. Yeah, that was and very so, different. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us, I mean, uh, and for those that don't know, you, uh, I think it was like a one-off gig, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and you basically filled Mike Keneally's shoes, uh, which are Enormous. Sizable. Which Enormous. are big, yes, yeah, so, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, so tell us a little bit about how you got hooked up with Brendan and that gig. So Brendan was someone who was like, you know, kind of a friend for a long time because of that whole group of people like Mike and, and Brian Beller and like the, you know, extended like satellite of people that I met through Tony McAlpine and like the, the Vi camp and that kind of thing. So I kind of knew him in passing like through the years and he used to do this um, this show with Steve A.G. at the Baked Potato in L.A. called uh, uh, Brendan Small and Steve A.G. are Baked at the Potato and they did this thing where it was like a, a comedy show with a live band and then like they would bring in like guest comedians every time and they would do like a mini set and then do a song with the band. And it, it was just like the, the school hang that like I just went, it was like once a month or something and I just hung out with them for a long time. And then, you know, I, I never thought that that the death clock thing was like ever a possibility because like, I mean, I didn't realize that to Brendan, it's like the, the characters themselves have nothing to do with the band. I always thought that like he must be like really religious with that and he could never hire a, a female, you know, or whatever, but it just, he doesn't think like that at all, you know? So I was really shocked when that came around and he called me and he's like, hey, so like, are you available to do this thing? And I'm like, fuck yeah, are you kidding me? <laughs> like I went to Berkeley, you know, like I never ever thought that could be a thing ever. So, so what was the what was the preparation? And I mean, was there was it was he was obviously familiar with her, so it wasn't maybe a traditional audition where you'd come in and play the things. But how did your preparation in that? It probably felt in a way like an audition because you still had to over prepare like you normally do, right? Right. Yeah. I mean, the the good thing was we were able to like we did the Skype thing a lot, you know, and just worked out parts. So we kind of sat with the set list, and he was like, okay, so mermaider for example you're gonna have like this riff here and then like maybe like cover the high parts over here and 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 he's very like open to like interpretation you know he he's like he's not like you have to play everything like on the record it's just like if it's this harmony that like starts on the third and like you make it sound good i'm good you know it was just like working out what the parts would be and the interesting thing too was that when i was playing with tony McAlpine, there was so much of that you know like he would send me new songs and it's never just rhythm guitar because he would play keyboards half the time. So I would have to like kind of switch between rhythm and lead. And after a while I would just start to guess on a new song, like, okay, let's see if I can figure out what my parts would be here. It's just based on like intuition and logic and what we've done so far. So when the death clock thing came around, I kind of like tried the same guessing game. And then when we would Skype every time I was like, yes, like, that was the part that I thought you would have me play, you know, and it just became this dorky game that I had with myself to to make the the ear training more fun, you know. So, and so we've we've talked about a couple uh, of your more successful uh, audition style situations. Are you able to share any stories of less successful auditions? Um, let me see. 
trying to think of like ones that were really bad or not necessarily bad, but maybe ones you didn't. And get. also how you can turn that into advice, perhaps for guitarists coming up today. You know, mm -hmm. what have you learned? Don't do this. <laughs> you know, don't what? Don't do this. You know, what have you learned to say to somebody coming up behind you? Do this differently. Don't do not do what I did. Do this differently when you're auditioning. Okay. Um, well, I mean, I think I, I have to go back to, to that mental piece that I was talking about before, you know, because I was always, like, ready to go for the audition itself. But I think, like, again, like, the vibe that you give out is so often the thing because people are also looking at the person that you are and whether they're going to want to hang out with you on the road and, and that type of thing. So, um, but yeah, I mean, I, I guess it's been years now. I don't think anybody really cares, but like that audition that I had that same week was for Katy Perry, you know? So when I came over to Cirque, I was like, it was a lot, I mean, it's easy to say, but it was a lot, a lot easier to be like, you know, probably something will work out. But and again, it's a lot easier to say it in a situation like that. But it, but like I'd had good fortune before and I was never confident either. So I think just going into it, not feeling like I'm showing these people that I'm desperate to get this job was like the helpful thing. Mm -hmm. I kind of came in just being like, oh, you know what? Like, whatever, you know, like whatever happens. And I ended up working there for two is, years. Is part so. of that uh, having the right attitude you alluded a minute ago to the fantastic level of preparation that you do, you know, how you really, really prepare. Um, would you say that that's the essential platform on which to come in with a confident attitude? For me, for me it is because I, I never felt like I was good at anything on the spot. Like, you know, improvising I always felt more insecure about. And just like for me as a person, it was the way to to get me out of anxiety. But I mean, I think it's a good, you know, good tip across the board to, to know what you're going for when you go in there. I mean, there's there's people who are really good at winging it on the spot and maybe they're better just being spontaneous, but at least I, I know it's not me. So maybe the advice is really to try to know yourself better and try to think about like, okay, what were the situations in which I felt really comfortable and, and why was that, you know, and, and just see like what works for you. But I think the more you can just, you know, be a homie and show up and like know what you're doing and just hang out with them, like, you know, that's that's all you can really do to put your best foot forward. So so one common thread, obviously, with the preparedness that you do, no matter what, whether it's Katy Perry, Cirque Soleil, Death Clock, can you give us some insight into uh, if you have a systematic way of breaking down uh, whether that material, new material, whether that be familiar, like maybe it's, because you know, I know you've played in Iron Maidens and you've played in Van Halen tribute bands, something like that, that songs you are heard of and maybe have played before, or stuff like Death Clock or Cirque Soleil that you might be coming in brand new. Well, for me, I it's, it's always the same plan, but it, it always helps me, like the familiarity is the, is the biggest piece. So for me, like, I, I've always learned stuff by ear. It was just the natural way that I like gravitated towards the, the guitar. And even before the guitar, if I had like a toy keyboard, I would like, you know, do this thing, try to figure out songs that I like. But it, it was just what always felt right to me. So I'd spent a lot of hours working on it. And then when it gets to the point where it's a set or it's a audition song or something like that, I know that like the more it's in my ears and the more I can like, you know, sing it in in my head and everything the the lesser the time that it's going to take me to learn it by ear you know so if i have the luxury of the time or i guess even if i don't i kind of just chunk the songs until i really feel like i really know them as a listener and only then do i go to the guitar and just be like okay now let's let's figure this out because by the time i arrive there i just have like a much better idea of the music just as a as a listener you know like I can wrap my head around the form and just like take mental notes and that kind of thing and then I go into actually learning it and and it's much quicker so again it's like it depends on how much time you have because like you know with the luxury of of time I'd, I'd like to get really into something and immersed by it and everything but I've definitely had situations where I've had to crunch it in like you know less than a day and that's you know, sometimes people put you in that situation. It sucks, but like, yeah. you know, 
it's it's okay if it's like three to five songs and then after that it's like real anxiety. <laughs> I already have anxiety. I don't need more. You know, it's like so. So you mentioned we know you're a Berkeley graduate, uh, as is Andy. Although I believe you guys were a couple years a couple apart. Of decades. Try that. <laughs> oh no, it was a couple of years. Was there anything in 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 that in that Berkeley community that they taught you about auditioning during that time, or was all the stuff you really felt you learned you had after school, after you got out of school? Um, I, it wasn't like it was strictly like we're going to teach you about the skill of auditioning or anything like mm-hmm. that, but there were a lot of kind of auditions built into the, to the school's program and stuff that I always felt like there was a lot of exposure to auditioning. Now, of course, it was like, you know, this is school and it's a bubble and it's not the real world and everything. And it's like, it doesn't really mean anything, but I definitely had a lot of situations that like were so cringeworthy to me that just made me feel like, yeah, this is why I like to prepare. Cause like, even if it goes okay when I didn't like to me, it, I look back at it and I'm just like, it's just, it feels embarrassing, you know? So I, I guess it's, it is maybe where I learned to go to the extreme, but we were definitely like immersed in it and, and at very low stakes. So all right, we're going to wrap up with this one last thing, Neely. So if you could give a, somebody as an audition coming up, uh, they're wrestling with the music, what are a couple, maybe three tips that you can tell them to keep in mind to help pass some of what your knowledge from these auditions, both good and bad, pass them on to somebody to help them ace their audition? Um, be organized if you can. So if, if learning the music is a challenge or if you don't have a lot of time or if you're freaking out because you don't have a lot of time, like for me personally, like just getting my head wrapped around the organization of how I'm going to do it and the time management of it like really, really helps. So whether you need to learn the, you know, learn the songs any other way, just getting kind of a framework of like, okay, I'm going to learn this here, this here, this here, and then I'm going to be ready by this time, and I have this amount of time to practice and, you know, kind of think out the whole plan. For me, again, it, like, just helps kind of keep me in the zone. And, again, just trying to go in there being a a, a friend and a good person and someone who's excited to work with, with others and just have a good time, like, playing music. And that's what I would do. All right, well... Well, thank you for joining us today, Neely, and talking all about this. We're going to have her back the rest of the week to talk about some other nerdy guitar stuff. So uh, until then, join us uh, later this week. Mm